Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Spotify for Podcasters has made our podcasting process so much easier and even has options like Q&As and polls so we can engage with listeners. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. The following contains descriptions of physical violence, sexual violence, and graphic descriptions of autopsies. Hey listeners, welcome to episode 42 of Teen Girls Investigate Crime Podcast. I'm Jillian. And I'm Izzy. And today we'll be covering the disappearance of Tara Calico. Spooky. <laughs> this is a pretty, like, well-known disappearance. Um, so I guess I'm really looking forward to talking about it. I like the really well-known ones that mm-hmm. are, like... But, like, okay, it's, like, well-known in the true crime world. It's not, like, John Bonet well-known. No, it's not, like, everyone knows about it. It's, like, if you're into true crime, you know about it. Yeah, like, if you know anything about true crime, you know about the Polaroid. So, you know, if you're cool, you know about this case. I'm Just a, kidding. I'm such a loser. Yeah. Okay, um, so you may know this case as the one with the Polaroid picture. Spooky. So shake yeah. it like a polo roll. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the <laughs> lovely musical performance. Thank you. <laughs> That's why I quit chorus. <laughs> okay. So we'll get into the whole Polaroid thing later, but let's just get started with some background. Okay. So if you listen to us before, we're a little bit switched up today. But that's okay. Izzy doesn't know how to do background. <laughs> we're loosey goosey. Okay. We're loosey goosey today. Anyways, bra- background. Not uh, background. Background. Tara, that's Lee, right? Mm-hmm. Lee Calico was born on February 28th of 1969 in Bellin, New Mexico. My mom was born that year. And also, like, wouldn't it be so sick to, like, be born on 1969? Anyways, which made her 19 at the time of her disappearance. Her parents were Patty Dole and David Calico, and her parents actually got divorced, and her mom later remarried to John Dole. And Tara also had a sister named Michelle, and her last name was Dole as well. And at the time of her disappearance, in September of 1988... Sorry, I'm sorry. You need to do some, like, vocal exercises I need to do some, like... (laughs) It's late. I just went to the dentist. Anyways. (laughs) September of 1988, she was 19 years old. So she was actually a sophomore in college at the University of New Mexico, and at the time of her disappearance, she was actually at her home in Belen, New Mexico. You already said this. Why can't I know. you just go with your original Bellin. pronunciation? Or I honestly don't remember what I said. But anyways, Tara was super freaking athletic, and her favorite type of exercise was biking, which she did very often. So she, you know, this is casual, just about 34 miles per day Holy on a shit. daily ride. That was along a highway, 47. <laughs> biking kills me. <laughs> <laughs> Over spring break, is in our beach, and we did like it wasn't even that far. It was what five or six miles, yeah. so, like in terms of Vikings, like so short. And afterwards, my ass hurt so badly that when we went to go sit on the golf cart, I like could not sit comfortably. Okay, well, to your defense, the bikes were really bad that we were using. It was so bad. I, I couldn't even start myself on the bike because it was too tall for me. And every time, I'd have to like kind of like balance myself. With, like, And I was so concerned about knocking myself over. I couldn't push off the ground yeah. because I was too short. It was such a disaster. And my seat was like spinning side to side the entire time. It was, it was a cluster. It was horrible. But it was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, she rode about 34 miles per day, and that would be along Highway 47 on her neon pink Huffy brand bike with yellow accents. And I keep trying to read that, like, fluffy is not a fluffy bike. It is Huffy, just in case I accidentally say that again. And she would also listen to music on her Walkman on these rides, which is, like, Queen. Like, that's so dope. I think everyone in that generation Very listened, vintage. To, listened to music on their Walkman. <laughs> Yeah, I know. But, like, I just can't imagine Is it, it. You would get a Walkman and, like, listen to it just, like, for the aesthetic. I would just keep it in my room for the aesthetic. I wouldn't <laughs> even use that thing because I would be too, like, cheapo to buy the cassettes for it. I would just have it. You just look at it. I just That's why I have a record player. 
legit haven't listened to a record on it for maybe two years, but I just haven't. Anyways, her mom, Patty, was also a super big biker, and sometimes her and Tara would go on these, like, bike rides together, meaning that Patty knew the route, like, very well, which is, like, important to know for Lady. Stop! <laughs> Why can I'm you sorry. speak? What did the dentist put in your mouth? I don't, I don't know. Later. Later. And... Uh, yeah, so she actually hadn't been going on the usual rides with Tara because she had, an encan- she had an encounter that was way too close for comfort. So when they were biking their usual route, a car had been purposely driving like super aggressively close to her Ew. and like passed her several times, did this multiple times, like it was on purpose. And like it obviously made her super uncomfortable and less eager to go ride. And like after this, like she urged Tara, Tara. It doesn't matter. Either it's one. The same name. To carry Mace with her since she no longer wanted to like accompany. A, oh my god, guys! I'm sorry. Accompany her and Tara, Tara refused. So she was just like, "No, the, I'm too good for." She Mace. was getting some bad vibes. No, Tara was like, "Hey, don't fuck with me. I can bike." Okay, but everyone should have mace. Personal opinion, guys. I don't have mace. Everyone should have mace. I have, I mace. have my own two fists. Yeah, my fist don't, wouldn't work <laughs> if they needed to. So, like, like, I literally think if someone came up to me and was like, give me all your money, I would lay on the ground. <laughs> Stop, no, you would not. <laughs> I would. I would punch him in the throat. I'm not even lying. My dad has taught me too well. You know, he almost enrolled me in karate lessons. That's cool. I actually wish I could take karate. Me too. I feel like if I tried now, though, I'd get very made fun of. <laughs> I always wanted, like, the belt. It's always, like, a big deal when you get, like, a colored belt. I Black think. belt! That's what I saw on, like, TV. Like, did you ever watch Kicking It? No. I wasn't a Disney XD kid. I was. Explains a lot about our personality. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Disney XD was, like, Disney for skaters. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can say I'm a skater then. I used to watch Mighty Men. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Oh my god, you don't know about Lab Rats? Nope. I used to watch, like, Jesse, Good Luck Charlie, Liv and Maddie. Doc McStuffins. I didn't watch Doc McStuffins. I wasn't four. I watched Doc McStuffins. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know why. I wanted to be a doctor. What can I say? Oh. A doctor of stuffed animals? <laughs> <laughs> like, imaginary animals in my backyard? <laughs> yes. Explains a lot about me. I used to watch Pair of Kings and Doc McStuffins mm-hmm. regularly. Anyways... And then it's also important to note that Tara actually did have a boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, but, like, he was never mentioned, he never had a name, like, released to the media, and I'm not sure how serious the relationship was, it's just very unclear. Yeah, I think he was just not really part of the investigation, either they blew him off the suspect list early. They blew him off. (laughs) Stop, what's wrong with you? Okay, They, they got him off the suspect list early, or he was just never really a suspect. Yeah, so, irrelevant. Bow! All right, um, I'm going to get into the timeline a little bit. So, um, on September 20th of 1988, at around 9.30 a.m., Tara plans to head out for her daily 34-mile bike ride. And, again, her typical route went along this New Mexico State Road 47, and she rode a neon pink Huffy bike with yellow control cables and sidewalls, which is, like, super noticeable in my opinion. Yeah. Also, how long do you think this bike ride takes, usually? I don't know. So that kind of brings me to something I'll mention in a little bit. Um, about she's not really sure herself how long it takes. <laughs> okay. So she did go sometimes on these bike rides with her mom, Patty. But on a recent bike ride, Patty had had this bad experience and she didn't really want to come anymore. But she really encouraged Tara to find a new route because she was like, well, if I don't want to be on it, why do I want my daughter on it? Mm-hmm. So she, she was like, maybe she should try to find a new route. Tara was like, no, mom, I can take care of myself. Um, then she told Tara, if you're not going to change your route, at least take some mace with you. And she was like, no, I could beat up a creepo if I wanted to, (laughs) and did not take mace with her. So before leaving, Tara told her mom to come pick her up if she wasn't home by noon, because she had plans to play tennis with her boyfriend at 1230. So I guess she doesn't really know how long these rides take. Yeah. And I assume she really didn't have a method of keeping track of the time during her bike rides, and that's why she asked her mom. She was like... You know, just, if if I lose track of time, come get me. Yeah. And I'm assuming, like, she could have not had a watch on or something. Like, now we take advantage of the fact that we all have phones on us. Yeah, I know. We don't go anywhere without our phones. Yeah. Yeah. So. Like, if she didn't have a watch, like, that makes perfect sense. Like, imagine just living oblivious of time. That'd be so uncomfortable. I, like, always need to know the time. Yeah. 
I feel like it would be uncomfortable, but also, like, blissful ignorance is, like, beautiful. Okay, so then around 12 p.m., Tara had not yet returned home, so Patty and John, who was her stepdad, went out to pick her up. Uh, they drove up and down State Road 47, but Tara was just nowhere in sight. Uh, she then, Patty, then called the police to report her daughter missing. Mm. So the next day, September 21st, her family organized this full-scale search surrounding her typical route, and her mom actually found her Walkman about 100 yards away from the road. And there were these footprints leading all the way up to this point. Oh, spooky. A little bit farther away, like, that's not the even spookiest part. A little bit farther away, there was bike tracks, vehicle tracks, and, like, an oil slick. Ooh. And you know what I just thought about that, like, actually doesn't make sense now, but, like, I was thinking for a second ago, like, what if she had taken a different route than normal and that's why they couldn't find her at first? Yeah. But then, I, but then they saw they found the Walkman, I so think, it didn't though, make sense. I think, though, she had told her mom to come pick her up on her typical route. Oh, so, so it was, like, it was unlikely that yeah, she would Yeah, she wouldn't have one. changed it up because her mom was supposed to pick her up. Yeah. Um, okay, so they find all this stuff, and the case kind of goes cold for a while, but on June 15th of 1989, it picks up a little bit. So in the time since her disappearance, there were various reported sightings of her across southern United States, but none of them were ever confirmed. I mean, this always just kind of happens with missing person cases, especially mm-hmm. ones where there's no, like body or like certain things were never recovered like it just people will be like oh yeah i saw them (laughs) anyway new attention was brought to the case in this june july time in 1989 because of an interesting photo that was found so a woman in port st joe florida which is like super far away from belen new mexico found a polaroid picture on the ground of a convenience store parking lot dude that's where we were i know i was about to say this is so weird this is so tied to spring break oh my god literally where we were for spring break on this bike ride (sighs) okay maybe it was the same gas station i don't know for context we went to a gas station on that bike ride did we weird yeah it's not a gas station it's a convenience store Actually, she went to a convenience store, not a gas station. <laughs> so cool. So funny. So cool. <laughs> so quirky of us. Okay, anyway. <laughs> when she arrived at the gas station, a white van had been parked in a parking spot. But then when she left, the van was gone, and in its place, there was this like little picture on the ground. And, you know, as one does, she just walks right up and picks it up. <laughs> and on it, it's a Polaroid picture showing a teenage girl and a young boy in a back the back of a white van with their hands bound and mouth sealed with black duct tape. So the woman brought this photo to police and it gained a lot of media attention, obviously. Tara's parents saw the picture and actually believed the girl in the photo was Tara and got in touch with Florida police. They said they recognized the scar on her leg that she had had from a car accident as a child and the book laying next to her was a copy of her favorite book, V.C. Andrews, My Sweet Audrina. Oh. Isn't that kind of, like, a creepy little that Like, a creepy little detail. Because, like, later on, people go in to say, like, oh, it's definitely not her based on, like, facial analysis, that, like, you know, amateur facial analysis. Mm -hmm. But I think that is such a, even if it isn't her, like, it's such a weird coincidence that it's her favorite book. Yeah, because that's, like, something that, like, a kidnapper would do, especially a kidnapper of children who keeps them alive, to be like, okay, like, I'll do this one thing for you. What's your favorite book? And then, like, brings them their favorite book. Yeah, it's so creepy. Or her parents were just over-exaggerating, and she read this book, like, one Once. time. Yeah, I know my parents would probably be like, oh, yeah, her favorite book is... It seems like a million book favorite books, though, so it's yeah, like, it, it really could be any book. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. I'm a bad example, but... <laughs> Additionally, the parents of missing New Mexico boy Michael Henley contacted Florida police because they thought they recognized Michael as the boy in the photo. So Michael Henley disappeared while on a camping trip with his father in the Zuni Mountains in 1988. And this photo was eventually analyzed, and it was concluded that the photo had been taken fairly recently to when the photo was found. Spooky. Yeah. Um, The FBI could not officially connect the people in the photo with their proper identities. However, a forensic artist at the time, so, you know, a little less technology and stuff, there was this, like, 85% match to them being Tara and Michael. Um, So they're thinking, like, Tara and Michael... And I don't, I don't really think it helped the investigation too much. I mean, no. it couldn't really lead anyone anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then in June of 1990, Michael Henley's remains were actually found in the Zuni Mountains, like just seven miles away oh, from the campsite. Oh, that's horrible. It is horrible. Um, he, the police believe he died, he wandered off and died of exposure. Oh, Jesus which Christ. Which is terribly sad, but it also means that he probably wasn't the boy in the photo. Yeah, you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, it just it brings up who is the boy in the photo, and is the girl still Tara? Because now there's no longer this official tie to, like, New Mexico. Exactly. 
Like, it's just, it's kind of weird. And all these people have done, like, amateur facial analysis on the internet. It's kind of funny to read. <laughs> um, I found this one website. I was about to use it as a source. I was like, I can't bring myself to use it. Someone oh wrote, like, God. a whole blog about, like, the facial comparison. I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. And then at the end, it was, like, the true story behind the polar. And someone wrote, like, a whole ass, like, fan fiction based on the photo. It was like, oh, this is a funny story about family that went on a trip. And then... The dad what? joked about putting the kids in the back seat, and they put duct tape over their mouth. That like, is not a joke. <laughs> First of all, if you think it is, there's something wrong. No. And then there's this whole story. It's like, oh, the kids were being bad, so he put them in the back and put told them to put duct tape on their mouth as a joke. And then they went in the back. And then he tied them up. Apparently, their hands weren't tied. I don't know. It was so stupid. I was like, what the oh fuck God. is this? How did I wander upon <laughs> this? Um, the fact that you read the whole thing, too. I didn't read, actually. I stopped halfway. That was the point I got up to. I just, like, the whole thing with that type of forensic, like, investigation into photos being like, oh, yeah, they both have brown hair. Well, no, there's a lot of stuff about, like, eye placement and eyebrow stuff. And actually, True. a lot of people say they don't think it's Tara because her age looks slightly off. Like, yeah. apparently she looks, like, 15 or 16 in the picture when Not she's actually 19. 19. yeah. But, you know, if you've been kidnapped for a year, you're probably malnourished. And, and like, you look different. Yeah. And then, also, there was, like, her eyebrow placement was str- I off. noticed that, actually. When Did I was, you? like, okay. looking at pictures between... Like, the girl in the photo looks slightly different. Like, her eyebrows look, like... Flatter. Yeah, I could see that a little bit. I don't know, but again, that could just be like that. Could literally be. um, I want to think angles. I do too. Because I think it makes sense. It does make sense. They wouldn't perpetuate this theory, right? If it wasn't her. And like I understand all these theories about it not being her, but it just it makes sense to me that it is. Yeah. And also, everyone seeing her in posed photos. Like, think about how different you make your face look when you're posing. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Also, there's another weird thing about the picture that was pointed out on this crappy-ass website that I stumbled upon <laughs> about how the kids, like, looked tan, which is kind of mm, strange, saying yeah. that they had been kidnapped for, like, a year-ish at that point, if it was... Well, they were in Florida. Okay, but here's the thing. If you're a kid, typically, you would kidnap out. someone, you keep them in, like, a house or something. Like, you don't want them out and about, so they really Unless get Unless it's Elizabeth Smart. Yeah, that's true. Elizabeth Smart walked around, though, in, like, blankets. But, like, she was outside a lot more than, like, yeah, typical that's, that's true, missing person. Okay. So, okay. This is... So, anything, it is possible. It is possible. Anything's possible. Okay. Other photos. So, over the years, actually, two other photographs have appeared that could potentially be Tara. So, the first is, like, a really blurry photo of a woman with tape over her mouth, and it was found in Montecito, California, and forensic evidence actually suggests that it was taken around 1989. Montecito is, like, really far from Port St. Joe. Yeah. And then also just, like, a blurry photo of a woman with tape over her mouth. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. And then the second one's even weirder. It's, it's literally a woman sitting on an, next to a man on an Amtrak train, and her eyes are covered, and she is loosely bla- bound, which was roughly dated back to about February of 1990. But, like... Uh, yeah. That could be like just like a funny photo of you and your friends okay. on a train. I actually saw that picture. I didn't see the first one, but I saw this Oh, you this did? One. I yeah. didn't see this one. Oh, uh, it's kind of horrifying, actually. Like, it, it's, it scared me a little bit. But um, that one, I think, mo- looked more like Tara. Okay, well, that's funny because her mom actually believes that the first photo was potentially her daughter, and she did not believe the second one was her. So I didn't see the first one. But the second one, something about it also, like... Also, the fact that there was no location that could be traced to it, like... Ooh, yeah, like it was just found it, somewhere? Yeah, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Like, an Amtrak train, you don't know where that was. Uh, is it, ew, is it this one? Okay, that's, yeah, that's really freaky. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that really scary? That one really scares me a lot. Ugh, oh my god, okay, I take back everything I said. No. This is one. the second one. Yeah. Okay, that one actually... I don't know, these photos really freak me out. Pictures really creep me out. Sorry, we're looking at pictures. That doesn't uh, look like her, though. It really doesn't, I'll be honest. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't. Like, that looks uh, more please like t- Oh, my God, I'm, like, actually scared I'm now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, like, too dark in his room. She doesn't have any fucking lights in here. Okay, I don't like having... I like ambient lighting. That doesn't look like her. Uh, this is so scary. 
That one doesn't scare me at that as much as the like train one. The train one's horrifying. Yeah, just look up Terra Calico photo train. That's what yeah, I did. That's so spooky. That's yeah, I really don't like that actually. That's, really that's even more. I didn't I'd never seen that. I really don't like that one. I'm so sorry <laughs> to anyone who just looked that up. That just gave me chills. Yeah. Um okay. anyways. So, some some suspects and theories now. Huh. Okay, so the first theory is the two men. In 2008, the biggest development made to date took place in this case. So, Sheriff Ray, Renny, Ren? Renee. Renee. <laughs> okay, that is not how you spell Renee. <laughs> yes, it is. That is not. Renee has My two uncle's e's. name is Renee, and that's how you spell it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought Renee was spelled differently. My bad. Renee. Sheriff Renee Rivera in Valencia County, New Mexico, claimed that he knew exactly who killed Talico, or Calico and why. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> to Calico. Okay. You said Talico. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, claimed that he knew exactly who killed Calico and why. So the most infuriating part of this is just that he never actually named suspects. He only explained that they were like these two teenage boys at the time of the experience. So now, at this point, they're like full-grown men. Ugh. Um, he men. said that they followed Calico on her bike and then some sort of accident happened that resulted in her dying. And in a panic, they disposed of her bike and body. But since there have, like, been no remains found, and there's really no evidence, like, at all to corroborate this, and not enough to, like, press charges, and there's no names, like, there's nothing really here. Mm -hmm. And obviously, this is just really infuriating to the family, because they publicize it, and they can't, like, get any actual information about it. And it's just, like, teasing. It's annoying. Yeah. Okay, and then this one is actually very similar to the first theory, I think, and it's kind of weird how similar they are, but this one is a deathbed confession. I was actually writing about this in class earlier, and someone looked over my shoulder and was like, what is a deathbed confession? Did someone ask you? Yeah. No, they did not. <laughs> yeah, and oh I was like, God. um, 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 never mind. Sometimes I pull up this document in the middle of class, and I'm like, oh shit, what if someone looks at it and asks what class this is for? Dude, no. Like, I've literally been, like, on websites looking at, like... At least you didn't look at that Amtrak picture in class. Oh my god, can you imagine someone to be like, are you would have okay? gotten sent to like the, the principal's s- office. <laughs> or like the counselor's office. We have like ten counselors at I our know. school, so. The student center? Jesus. The student center They rocks. kicked me out the other day. Okay. I, our hippie school has a place where you can go and hang out if like your stress has just peaked. Yeah. That's why and I, I think- went and I wasn't ready to leave because I didn't want to go to Spanish and I also didn't <laughs> feel good. But then they were like, okay, honey, your 45 minutes is up. You need to leave now. I was in there for way longer than 45 minutes the other day. Yeah, and then I had to leave. And it was great. It was great. Anyways, in 2013... This, this man needs to go to the student center. <laughs> <laughs> in 2013, a man named Henry Brown, the most basic name, made a deathbed confession to the police. And he claimed that non, not long after the disappearance, he was... In a man named Lawrence Romero Jr.'s basement, for some god-awful reason. Basements are never good. And he saw a young woman wrapped in a tarp and buried in a makeshift grave in the room. What? Yeah, just in the corner. And he was like, hey, um, Roman Marrero and Dan Silva and some random redhead, why is that in the corner of this basement? And they were like, oh, along with this dude named Lero Chavez... We were in a truck, and we saw Tara. He was like, okay. And so, like, they tried to get her attention, but in the process, they ended up hitting her on accident, and they abducted her. And, like, this hit wasn't, like, fatal at the moment, but they ended up taking her, and they took her to some sort of, like, grave, and they raped her. And, like, during this whole time, she was apparently alive. And they claimed that she had fought back, and she threatened to tell the police when she escaped, and then Romero ended up stabbing her. And, like, Brown claims that they first put her body in a bush, but when the investigation got more heated, they moved her to the basement to, like, stay away from the public eye. And they never actually... Okay, this is the weirdest part to me. And, like, this makes me wonder why nobody's looked into this even further, but, like, apparently they never got caught because Romero Jr.'s dad was the sheriff at the time. And after finding out about the murder, they helped, like, he helped them to cover it up. Oh, jeez. And he claimed that her body had been, like, ultimately disposed of in a nearby lake and that her bike was thrown into a junkyard so it could never be found again. And... I'm sorry, do people not go search junkyards? 
It takes so long. Have you ever seen a junkyard? No. One time when I was in school in St. Louis, we went to a junkyard for a field trip. Why? And we were like going over the like piles of trash in this bus. <laughs> we weren't allowed to open the windows because it would kill us. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, another weird thing about the story is that Romero, Ju- Romero Jr. actually ended up committing suicide in 1991. But, like, it's not clear why he did that. It wasn't sure if that was, like, because of ta- Tara or, like, why. It's just, it's important to mention that he did, com- like, complete suicide in 1991. And despite witness testimonies, there were, like, no charges ever filed and no arrests were made because, like, there's no body... And the evidence just, like, it's circumstantial. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. And... It makes sense. There's just nothing to support it. Yeah, exactly. And there were even, like, witness testimonies. Like, I'm not clear if this went to court or anything, but, like, apparently there were a bunch of witness testimonies, but nothing ever went through because it was, like, a lot of circumstantial evidence. But, like, yeah. at the same time, I feel like they could have dug a little bit more deeper into that. They probably could, but when their former cops is involved, that looks terrible True. for their department. Exactly. And there's other, like, some other stuff to support this theory, and that's that basically, like, other witnesses claim that they saw a light-colored, like, basically white or gray 1953 Ford pickup truck following Calico. Was that the same as the other truck? Yeah. Ah. So, that's a little bit weird. Yeah. So there's just, like, really circumstantial. And then there's, like, that experience her mom had where there's... Yeah. And it kind of goes hand-in-hand with the theory I talked about. Like, someone could have just known about this, and that Mm -hmm. was, like, their version of the story they had. Exactly. Because it's kind of similar. It is really similar. But, okay, I kind of hate that theory because, well, A, I mean, it sucks. It's, like, real shitty. Yeah. But then, like, that doesn't explain any of those pictures that, like, were linked to her. No, so who are the people in those pictures? Is that one person? Is that multiple people? Like, what's the deal? Is she one of them? Is she all of them? Is she none of them? Oh, my God. Like, are those, like... Because it's just weird that they're all from the same time, too. What, like, what is the context behind those pictures? It's horrifying. Yeah. And, like, w- like... Pictures don't lie, and I think that's why I'm so scared of them. That's such a good line. I but know. that's true. <laughs> like, it's literally, like... The thing about those pictures is that they may not be Tara. Tara. Then who are they? But who is it? So, this was the disappearance of Tara Calico. Tune in next week for, or actually, no, tune in again on two weeks for another new episode. In the meantime, follow us on Instagram at tgic.podcast and review us on Apple Podcasts. Bye! Bye.